Right. Yep. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, my name is Jiayi, and I will be hosting today's webinar. So we have been conducting the IP at case study series since March this year. And now we have come to the fifth topic of the series. Today, our presentation is about the Swedish furniture retailer, IKEA, which is known for their flat pack furniture, Scandinavian minimalist design and affordable price. So IKEA's forward thinking strategy made it the top furniture seller in the world. And intellectual property has played a great part in IKEA's success. Today, we will explore IKEA's IP secret behind its international success. Before we start, let me go through the house rules. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to our speaker by typing your questions into the chat box on Zoom or the comment box on uh, Facebook. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we will collect them and try to address as many questions as possible during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Since today's topic is about IKEA, we hope you can post questions related to IKEA's intellectual property strategies or activities. If you are uh, viewing us on Facebook right now, uh, we hope you can uh, share today's uh, webinar with your family or friends by clicking the share button on Facebook. All right, so uh, yeah, I see that we have quite a number of uh, participants on Zoom right now. So would you mind introducing yourself to us uh, by typing, by telling us your name and also your company's name on the chat box. So hi, uh, Anis from um, Inovi. Hi. So we have a few more joining us too. So yeah, please tell us your name and also your company's name. While waiting for your responses, uh, let me run a very quick survey. So what do you like most about IKEA? IKEA's furniture has a very clean, stylish and simple design. I'm personally a fan of uh, minimalist design. So if you are the same as me uh, and love Scandinavian minimalism or aesthetic, please type one in the chat box. So number two might not be a popular choice, but there are people who enjoy DIY work as a hobby and have fun assembling furniture with family and friends. If you appreciate self-built furniture that also allows customization and provides you a sense of connection with the furniture uh, and that it makes you feel confident after successfully building it and makes you feel more attached to it, please type two in the chat box. Okay, price is very important to IKEA's business strategy. Uh, the furniture's material and flat uh, packaging lower the production and also logistic costs and eliminates the assembling costs as well. So making the furniture more affordable. If this is the reason uh, why you purchase IKEA's furniture, please choose three. So some people uh, may find IKEA store layout very appealing, uh, especially the aesthetically designed showrooms uh, that can provide you a sense of comfort and pleasure of discovery that makes shopping uh, at IKEA a retail therapy. If you agree with this, uh, please type four in the chat box. Or if you're drawn to the yummy yet cheap food from IKEA's cafe, such as its iconic meatballs uh, that allows you to recharge and continue shopping, please choose five. So we have uh, quite a lot of responses from you. Let me go through your responses first. Also, hi, Viren from uh, KL Connect IT Development. So hi, uh, Eddie from uh, Gupta, Gupta from Spring Galaxy. Uh, hi, Leon from Vitrox. Uh, we have Nation from uh, TTY Biofarm. So Varen has selected one, two, three, four, five. So every uh, um, everything that I mentioned here, or options, <laughs> or only kai to all. So we have uh, uh, Eddie from UTM. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. So that's also Farhana from Top Love. So uh, like Nashwari chose one, two, three. 
so you are not a fan of the meatballs and also the store layout. <laughs> so Leon choose chose one two four. So we way from AMC Group. Hi. So uh, Black Nishwari. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. So uh, from A and A Chesterfield. So we have uh, Sarajit from Sonoda and Kobayashi IP Law. So you chose three and five of oh, cheap and affordable furniture and also the food. City chose one, two, four. So uh, Eddie, 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 Eddie chose one, two, five. So Susie chose one, four for Sonali. Hi, Sonali. Okay, yep. So I see that most of you chose one. Uh, there are also some who chose uh, three and four too. All right. So uh, yeah, it looks like the majority of you responded um, more than one, more than one answers. So thank you for your responses. So we now know that uh, it's not just the furniture that attracts um, the public, but also uh, the food as well, the food from IKEA. So uh, now I would like to introduce our speaker today. He's Mr. Lok Chun Hong, the founding partner of Inta IP Group, uh, which has been established for more than two decades. Mr. Lok has vast experience in handling IP protection and monetization matters in the Southeast Asia region mm -hmm. uh, for multinational companies, listed companies, SMEs, and also universities. So without further much ado, let's welcome Mr. Lok. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jai, for the introduction. Uh, a very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, good afternoon to everyone who joined today's uh, uh, webinar. Uh, let me just share my slide first. Sorry, just a minute. So Jai can see my slide. Yep. Put it in a full mode and let me just... Right, it looks good. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, welcome everyone to our uh, webinar. Uh, on uh, today, uh, we are going to explore uh, IKEA. Uh, we would like to explore how IKEA uh, uh, innovated uh, its business model and uses intellectual property rights to uh, sustain its competitive advantages. Uh, uh, in, this is the fifth installment in our series of uh, IP case study webinar. And the uh, purpose of the webinar is to look at the success story of some of the most well-known and successful company and see how they integrate their IP strategy with their business strategy. Yeah, we would like to explore uh, how IP support their business to grow and to be competitive. So today uh, in IKEA, we are going to share with you, uh, 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 we, are look, we are going to look at IKEA from a few aspects. We, we will first look at the business model of IKEA and we will look at uh, some of the important IP, IP asset owned by IKEA and how uh, IKEA use IP to create sustainable competitive advantage. Just a minute. Okay, this is a little bit about uh, myself. Uh, I'm an IP lawyer. Uh, I'm uh, practicing in Singapore and Malaysia and uh, I have been uh, uh, around for 20 years, uh, uh, actively doing work uh, for the Southeast Asian country. And uh, uh, apart from IP protection work, I'm also involved in the IP strategy and also IP monetization uh, work. Okay, uh, let's turn our attention to IKEA. Okay, so... Uh, IP is a very, is a strategic tool uh, that deliver significant value to IKEA. As you all know, IKEA uses or introduces uh, the flat packing business model, 
And through this flat packing business model, it turned the customer into a free workforce uh, that take over some of the value change of a traditional uh, furniture uh, manufacturing value change. Uh, through uh, this flat packing business model, uh, customers will have to buy the furniture in pieces and they would have to bring it home themselves and they would have to assemble them at home in a DIY manner. So by doing that, uh, some of the cost saving uh, is in turn passed back to the consumer and consumer are able to you know, buy uh, more uh, cheaper furniture from IKEA. So today, in today's presentation, uh, we want to look at some of the IP owned by IKEA and how these IP are being used to, uh, for, by IKEA to protect its business model and also uh, to uh, protect its profit margin and in the process become one of the world's largest furniture retailer. Okay, a little bit of overview about IKEA. IKEA it, uh, was set up in uh, year 1943. Uh, originally, it was started off as a mere order business and selling and began to sell furniture in 1948. And the first IKEA store, retail store, was set up in 1953 in Smolensk, Sweden. Uh, today, IKEA is the world largest manufacturer, uh, world largest retailer of furniture. Uh, it has uh, more than 250 stores in Europe and the rest of the world, uh, it has uh, about 100 uh, stores. So uh, currently, uh, IKEA is a non-listed entity, it's not listed, it's a private company. And in year 2019, uh, it has a revenue of 48 billion US dollar. So uh, this is the financial of IKEA. If you look at the uh, sales of IKEA, it has been on the upward, upward trajectory uh, for the past uh, 30 years, uh, past 50 years. And uh, in year 2021, uh, its revenue has amounted to about 41 billion euro. Uh, this was in spite of the COVID lockdown. Uh, you know, we have uh, the world saw uh, lockdown uh, due to COVID pandemic, but uh, IKEA was still able to grow 6.6%. Uh, uh, I think contributed largely uh, by the uh, digital and e-commerce uh, marketing and delivery. Okay, uh, before we look at the business uh, model of IKEA, I would like to uh, look generally at the uh, uh, general competitive business strategy uh, uh, by uh, Michael Porter, the world famous uh, management guru. Uh, Michael Porter, according to uh, Michael Porter's uh, generic strategic model, uh, for businesses to be competitive, uh, you have to be either, uh, there are three ways for businesses to be competitive. First is uh, you uh, offer cost leadership, right? Uh, you offer things which is cheaper than your competitor. You sell things cheaper than your competitor. And or you come up with a product which is differentiated, uh, which has unique selling proposition for your target client. And thirdly, you have to choose the kind of customer that you want to serve, right? So uh, today, we are looking at IKEA. IKEA adopts the cost leadership uh, business model, and it is targeting the mass market. You know, it's selling things cheaper than other competitor, and it's targeting across the board to you know all the con all the customer. Uh, in the previous uh, case study that we have done, we have also seen that we we have also seen Tesla and Apple. Apple, we are going to talk about it later. Uh, next in, during our next presentation, but we see Tesla, we see Samsung, uh, they have a different business strategy. I think they focus on differentiation and they target a certain group of customer, right? But in the case of IKEA, uh, the business model of IKEA is to adopt a flat pack 
uh, ready to assemble furniture uh, that you can easily, uh, it is easier and cheaper to transport from the factory to the retail center. And the customer will find those modular pieces that they want to buy from the IKEA open storeroom. They will transport it and they will assemble them DIY at home. So through this uh, process, uh, there is uh, IKEA enjoy substantial operating uh, operational cost saving, right? Because the assembly part will be performed by the customer. And also uh, because the storeroom also act as a warehouse, uh, the customers can select the furniture at the warehouse. They can pick up the, uh, the furnitures. They can transport at their own cost back home and they can trans assemble the furniture at home at their own cost. And all this cost saving will reduce the cost of uh, IKEA furniture and this cost saving will be transferred uh, to the end consumer. So if you base on the Michael Porter's generic strategy, uh, the business strategy of IKEA is to provide cost leadership, right? You want to sell, always find ways to sell furniture at a cheaper cost to the customer. And in order to achieve that, uh, IKEA look for custom, look for supplier, look for manufacturer that manufacture uh, well-designed flat pad, modular, simple, minimalist design sub-assembly at the lower cost. And the customer will, will buy those sub-assembly themselves and they will uh, uh, assemble themselves at home. Right? So afterwards, in some of the pattern, we want to see you know, how some of the cost can be reduced, right? Uh, how, how, what are some of the technology used by IKEA to reduce the cost and how the IKEA uses pattern to protect it. And also uh, flat packing uh, does not only enable cost saving from enlisting the customer to do the work, it also lead to overall cost saving in the storage and in the transportation of the furnitures from the factory to the retail center and from the retail center to the to to the to the buyer's home, right? So so flat save uh, flat packing also enable cost saving uh, in the logistic, and that will that's contribute uh, largely uh, to the low cost strategy of IKEA. So uh, IKEA low cost competitive strategy. In order to to meet this low cost competitive strategy, uh, IKEA has developed many technical solution. Uh, many value change to support these strategies. And uh, we, are, we are going to explore some of the pattern used by IKEA to protect this technical solution. So if you take the uh, example of a sofa, right? What, what, what IKEA uh, did uh, in order to deliver uh, 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 the sofa is they are able to uh, break this sofa into sub-assembly that consumer can install them easily at home is that they're simple to assemble at home and they pack, they flat pack it uh, into packages. And in the process of doing it, uh, you reduce the, the packing, packing size by 50%. And you can also reduce the number of uh, trucks that you need to, uh, to bring the furniture from the factory to the, the, to the household. And in this whole pro in this process, you know, the cost saving uh, will be passed on to the customer. So if you if you look at the uh, if you look at the uh, the strategy canvas of IKEA, uh, you, you can you can see what are the focus of IKEA. Uh, first, you know, the, the main the main uh, focus of IKEA is to sell furniture at the lowest cost. Uh, you know, ready to assemble parts, low price, modular furniture. And in order to sell this lower cost uh, furniture, you would have to sacrifice, uh, you know, customization. Basically, uh, it, you, you can only buy standard sub-assembly part at the IKEA store. Uh, but IKEA mitigate that uh, uh, the lack of customization with very nice design, which, which are developed in-house. Uh, and, and most of the design are protected by uh, industrial design. Afterwards, we are looking, we are going to look at some of those uh, 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 design protected uh, 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 
uh, products. And also, uh, IKEA uh, store all this furniture in huge warehouses worldwide, right? So in these huge warehouses, uh, you have a huge range of furniture which you can buy uh, in the store. You can have instant fulfillment. Yeah, this is something that, you know, if you do not have flat packing uh, 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 mod uh, business model, uh, you, you will not be able to store so many furniture, so wide a range of furniture in your store. And you also have a large on-site inventory and all these on-site inventory are stored in the form of flat pack and you have a, a, a good logistics system, you know, to, to store and to manage those uh, uh, system, uh, flat pack. And uh, IKEA has limited service, right? When you go to IKEA, it's very hard for you to find any helper, but uh, IKEA mitigate that with extensive uh, customer information, you know, delivered to you nowadays digitally. And in the past, you also have the catalog. So basically, you can find everything about the information, all information about the IKEA furniture in those catalogs and those digital information. And, 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 and you, you, you can just install that uh, at, uh, at ease. So this is the uh, strategy canvas uh, of IKEA. And afterwards, you know, uh, in our analysis of uh, IKEA business strategy, we are looking at some of the IP, that some of the important IP uh, uh, used by IKEA to protect all this uh, uh, unique selling proposition. Okay, so uh, the economic IP is a very important uh, uh, economic mode, right? For all or for businesses to do well, right? You you need to have certain uh, sustainable competitive advantage, and in order to be sustainable, in order to prevent uh, competitors from copying your unique selling proposition, you need to create an uh, economic mode to prevent a uh, competitor from coming in and copy away your idea. So economic mode, this, the idea of economic mode was popularized by Warren Buffer. And uh, I think all businesses that want to do well, uh, you need to have some form of economic mode. And economic mode can be established by IP, by brand, by economic of scale. And in the case of IKEA, uh, the, the main economic mode that protects IKEA business model is uh, intellectual property, right? So we're going to look at the how intellectual properties are used by IKEA for these purposes. So uh, I would like to uh, start by, you know, before we go into IP, IKEA, intellectual property asset, I would like to share a little bit about uh, the fundamental of IP. And um, there are five IPs that I think is important to all businesses. Uh, first, it's patent. If you have a new invention, a new technical solution, uh, you, you probably would like to patent it so that you know no one can copy your technological idea. And uh, copyright uh, is also another form of IP that protects your content. Uh, you know, all businesses require to do marketing you have to tell story about your business and all the content of your storytelling are protected by copyright. In the case of IKEA, you can see, you know, the catalogs, the, the, you know, all the digital marketing material are protected by copyright. And uh, you also have trademark to protect your brand. You know, brand will be a very important uh, 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 tools for you to own your goodwill uh, and industry design, uh, protects the exterior appearances of your products. Uh, so if you have, uh, in the case of furniture uh, business, uh, the, the outlook are very important. So you, you will protect those outlook using industry design. Uh, last but not the least, every businesses also have a lot of uh, uh, database, uh, uh, you know, valuable information, and this can be protected by trade secret. So uh, all these IPs, uh, they are uh, intangible asset. Uh, it, 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 you can give a value to all these IP because uh, it enable your business to be competitive. You know, so so all these IP uh, afterwards we can see some of the value of some of IKEA's IP. Uh, but the most important 
characteristic of IP is it gives the owner a monopolistic right, right, for the creator of the idea. So if I have a new solution, a new brand, uh, new content, and if I register them as IP, then I have a monopolistic right. I own those IP and I can go after any retailer, any user, or any, any manufacturers that uses the idea. And all IP, because it is uh, the monopolistic right comes from the government. So you need to go to different government to get this monopoly right. So uh, it is a right limited by jurisdiction. And last but not the least, uh, it is a limit. Uh, all the IP has a lifespan, right? So if you have a pattern, it lasts for 20 years maximum, trademark 10 years, you can renew. So these are the basic characteristics of IP that all businesses have to know. And in the case of uh, IKEA, uh, you know, uh, intellectual property is the source of competitive advantage, source of competitive edge. Uh, IKEA has many functions that helps it uh, helps IKEA to achieve the business model, to lower the cost, to do the logistic in a more cost-effective way. All these functional solutions, uh, IKEA has patented to protect it. And IKEA has a lot of very nice design and all these designs are protected by industrial design. And as you know, the brand IKEA is a world famous brand and all the goodwill associated by IKEA is protected by trademark. And also IKEA has a, a, a uh, it is very good, you know, in telling, promoting the uh, the, the the story, uh, the content of, of the uh, the business. So all this talk storytelling, the expression, the original spell, uh, or, uh, storytelling are protected by copyright. And in today's world, uh, it is uh, 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 in today's knowledge based economy. Uh, uh, IP, the intangible asset, has become more important than the tangible asset. Uh, if you look at the uh, Fortune 500 companies, uh, if you look at this uh, S&P 500 companies, you can see that in year 2018, of the five biggest companies, Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, uh, you know, more than... 80% of the value of the company are attributable by the intangible asset. The tangible asset uh, only constitute, you know, probably less than uh, 20%. Uh, as, as you can see, you know, as we move from industrial age to the uh, knowledge age, uh, the importance of intangible, uh, like your pattern, your trademark, your copyright has become more and more important. And this is the reason why you know, all businesses have to pay more attention uh, to the protection of your intangible assets. Okay, uh, I would like to start uh, by looking at the copyright, yeah, the copyright of IKEA. Uh, as you know, IKEA was uh, famous, you know, for distributing its yearly catalog uh, uh, to all its customers. Uh, I, I used to receive uh, the IKEA catalog uh, no, almost every year until year 2020, uh, when IKEA finally decided you know, to stop printing the, the physical catalog and fully digitalize the content. Uh, uh, but this uh, IKEA catalog uh, is one, was one, one of the most distributed books in the world. Right, it, it's uh, it, it's been published more than the Bible or the Quran. Right? In in year two thousand sixteen, uh, more than two hundred million copy of IKEA catalog was distributed in thirty like two languages to more than fifty countries. Right, so these are uh, very important uh, content marketing content by IKEA, and it is uh, so widely distributed that you know it become very very popular. And uh, in one of the cases, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in year 1988, there's one uh, furniture chain store based in U.S. California uh, uh, called Store Furnishing International. They also copied part of the publication, right? They also copied part of the publication and they also mimic some of the uh, retailing concept of IKEA. Uh, to do business. Uh, in one of the episodes of Simpson, uh, Simpson in 1992, uh, Simpson actually made references 
to the store, the store outlet, uh, in a parallel that they call as shop rather than store. But, uh, you know, they feature a store style building, uh, which is uh, presented in IKEA's famous yellow and blue color, right? So, so, so uh, uh, IKEA took an action against store in 1998 claiming copyright infringement, claim that the, the store, the store furnishing outlet has copied this catalog and, uh, and also not only copied the catalog, but copy the retail concept, you know, the way they lay out, you know, the, the, uh, the furniture, uh, the, in the retailing setup of the store, uh, very, were, were very similar. Uh, to that of IKEA. Uh, and the case eventually was settled out of court between IKEA and store, and store was forced to change the layout of their store and also to change uh, the design of the marketing and advertising material, uh, the catalog. So uh, as, as a result of that also, store was eventually uh, acquired by IKEA in 1992 when IKEA was trying to enter the American market. So you can see that, you know, this, uh, uh, this catalog, right? The way businesses presented, uh, you know, their content, presented their uh, story to the customer. Uh, uh, if, if it's done well, right? Uh, copyright, uh, uh, it become a very important asset of a company. Okay, next, I would like to turn to uh, the IKEA trademark story. Okay. So, uh, this is the value of IKEA. Uh, you can see that in year 2021, uh, IKEA's brand was worth 17.9 uh, billion euro, right? Uh, it is a billion dollar brand. And the IKEA brand is an acronym, right? that consists of the initial of the founder, uh, in Eva Kamprat, and also uh, the town where the founder was from, uh, which is uh, MTAD and also Aquina, right? So these four acronym uh, put together uh, will give you the IKEA brand. And the IKEA brand was uh, registered worldwide in more than 80 countries, mainly in the class of 20 and 21. 20 is for furniture, 21 is for household, and class 35 for the retail outlet. And IKEA owns a portfolio of uh, 1,700 uh, trademark worldwide. Okay, so uh, IKEA has encountered some uh, challenges, you know, for them to own their trademark worldwide. Uh, one of the uh, famous case that came to our attention involved uh, IKEA trademark in Indonesia uh, in, in 2016, right? Uh, uh, we all read the news that, oh, IKEA lost its trademark in Indonesia. And uh, what actually happened, right? So uh, what, what had happened was uh, IKEA has been registering their Indonesian trademarks in class 20 and 21. 20 is for furniture, 21 is for household uh, utensil, uh, twice. They register first in 2006, and they register again in 2010. And in 2013, there, there was an Indonesian local company by name of PT Ratania Katulistiwa, uh, based in Surabaya, trying to register IKEA trademark, right? And this IKEA trademark was actually an acronym of the Indonesian company's name, uh, in Intan Katulistiwa Esa Abadi. Uh, in class 20 and 21 also in 2013. But it, their original application was rejected because you know there was an earlier registration by IKEA in 2006 and 2010. So what, what the Indonesian company did was the, he, they applied to invalidate the IKEA 2006 and 2010 trademark in the Jakarta court, uh, alleging that IKEA did not use the mark, the, the mark uh, consecutively for three years. Under the trademark law, if a mark is registered and you don't use it for three years consecutively, uh, 
the mark can be invalidated due to non-use. And IKEA only opened its Indonesian store in 2014. So during that time, e-commerce wasn't very popular yet, right? So there was no use of mark in Indonesia. So uh, the Indonesian Jakarta court decided that the two 2006 and 2010 mark was invalid due to non-use. And IKEA tried to apply to the Indonesian Supreme Court Court and but was rejected because there was no evidence of use. So it created panic, right? A lot of people asked, you know, what happened to IKEA in Indonesia? So, uh, so uh, in, in 2016, February, uh, uh, IKEA came up with a press statement uh, to clarify their legal position in Indonesia. So uh, the inter IKEA system, the owner of the trademark, uh, put up a publication in the Indonesian newspaper, clarifying that even though the 2006 and 2010 trademark was invalidated, uh, it was not barred from using the mark in Indonesia. The reason being, IKEA, they are aware that they did not use their mark actively in Indonesia. So after immediately after they opened up their store in Indonesia, in 2014, they refiled the trademark again in class 20 and 21. So even though the 2006 and 2000 trademark was invalidated, uh, IKEA still have the 2014 trademark. And this 2014 trademark was valid because they have already started selling uh, IKEA trademark in Indonesia. So even though IKEA lost the trademark, but the war, it, it, it didn't, uh, it didn't lose it lost the battle, but it didn't lose the war because eventually the 2014 trademark still carries the day and uh, IKEA still belongs uh, you know, to the uh, Swedish company. So what is the moral of the story, right? So uh, I think uh, everyone should remember that if you have your trademark, you have to use it uh, even after you register it. Uh, if you don't use it, non-use will lead to invalidation. And nowadays, because of internet, because of e-commerce, you can actually create you uh, by uh, having your presence uh, online and having uh, some uh, contact uh, in the country that you want to use your trademark. Uh, INTA has actually come up, the International Trademark Association has come up with a guideline uh, like, you know, if you want to create a use, uh, say if you have registered a mark in the country and you want to create a use, uh, this is what you need to have, right? You have to have a, a, a portal, a, a presence, a digital presence. Please, uh, you, 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 you will be able to, uh, you know, the customer of that country will be able to access you uh, through, a, through a website in that country. So these are the guidelines that you have to follow to create use uh, to, so that you can preserve uh, the validity of the trademark. Okay, so uh, this is for the IKEA trademark story. And next, I would like to move to the IKEA industrial design, right? So uh, as you, as mentioned by Jiayi, uh, IKEA is well known for its minimalist Scandinavian design, and IKEA jealously protect those designs with industrial design, right? A lot of IKEA design, very nice design, are actually protected by industrial design. I'm going to share with you uh, three of the most popular industrial design owned by IKEA. Uh, first is the shelving unit. Uh, uh, I think many of us would have this uh, shel shelving unit at home. The unique shape uh, is actually registered, protected by way of industrial design, right? This is on the shape, nothing to do with the function, but more on the shape. And also uh, the, the wooden shelf, uh, uh, also popular by IKEA is also protected by industrial design. Uh, apart from furniture, in, uh, IKEA also sell a charging pad and this wireless charging pad is also registered as industrial design by IKEA. So these are the most three most popular design uh, registered by IKEA. Okay, uh, I would like to share one case study with you involving design and that is the uh, Ikea Prakta bag, right? So whenever we go to Ikea, I think this bag would look very familiar to you. And this uh, Prakta, uh, blue and yellow Prakta uh, bag 
uh, is sold for 90, uh, 99 cents uh, in, in US. And uh, in July 2017, uh, one of these uh, famous brand, Balakiaga, uh, actually launched uh, Ariga, Ariga bag, uh, which it retail for 1,300 pounds. Right? This Baragya, this bag uh, looks very similar uh, to the IKEA 9910 truck car carry bag. But unfortunately, IKEA did not register any industrial design to protect the bag. Uh, IKEA can resort to passing off or unfair competition. But in order to win in passing off or unfair competition, uh, you need to have very significant evidential, uh, you, you need to have a lot of evidence to support passing off or unfair competition. Uh, the, the best way to protect this type of uh, design is to file an industrial design, which IKEA didn't have. So, so what happened in this case is, instead of going after Balenciaga with design, uh, IKEA took a novel approach. Uh, IKEA make the best use of the situation and they put up an ad to say that, you know, they were deeply flattered that, you know, Bala Giaga being a, a, a branded uh, bag manufacturer, they come up with a bag which closely resemble IKEA iconic 99 cent blue bag. And uh, they are the original one, they come first. Yeah, and they, they, they were flattered by people copying their original design. Okay, so they can't sue because they have no industrial design. They turn it around, you can turn it around and say, I, feel, I put up an ad, a, a campaign, a social media campaign, and say that, oh, I feel flattered. People copy my original design, nothing beats the original, right? So this is how. Uh, what happened in this case, uh, Ikea versus Balikiaga, there was no action. It's a, a, a publicity a PR uh, stunt by Ikea to turn things around. Okay. I would like to move on, right, to pattern. And I think uh, from the beginning, I have uh, talked about the business model of Ikea, how Ikea was able to come up with the flat packing uh, business model and how IKEA developed many solutions and value change to reduce the cost. And now I would like to show and share with you how this innovation, the technical solution and the innovative value change was protected using patent. So uh, IKEA has a huge portfolio of patents. Uh, it has about 100, uh, 1,984 patents worldwide uh, coming from 960 patent family. And out, out of these 100, uh, 1,900 patents, uh, 1,200 patents are the active patents. And uh, these are the numbers, uh, patent trends of IKEA. Uh, yeah, it has uh, it, it found, uh, patents, uh, around, uh, you know, throughout the year. And most of the IKEA being a European company, it founds the most pattern in Europe, followed by US and America. Okay, so uh, I would like to, but IKEA has many, many patterns. Many of the patterns uh, relates to the function of the furniture, how you can, you know, uh, extend your table, how you can, you know, join the furniture together. Uh, uh, due to the restriction of time, I would like to limit to five areas, right, which I see is significant to IKEA flat packing business model. And I'm going to share, uh, you know, based on our research, some of the patterns which we feel uh, are important to protect that unique selling proposition, right, to achieve this business model. Uh, they are broken down into five areas. Uh, IKEA come up with a way where consumer at home, when you do DIY, you can assemble the furniture parts together, easy assembly, right? That's one. Uh, the second is flat packing. In order to do flat packing, you need to come up with a packaging that protects 
the furniture part inside the flat pack. So IKEA has innovated on the packaging technology to deliver that. Uh, in order to send this, uh, you know, and store, to transport and to store those flat packs, you have to have a, a system, a, a sustainable logistic system, right, to, 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 to transport those flat packs effectively and cheaply. So I'm going to look at uh, one of the innovation introduced by IKEA and the pattern that protects those innovation. And I think uh, IKEA has always tried to lower the cost. So it comes up with low cost material. So in one of the pattern that I'm going to share with you, uh, you can see how IKEA uh, lower the cost of the, uh, the raw material, the, 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 the board that they produce. And last but not the least, I think safety is also very important for end user. Uh, and uh, IKEA also uh, come up with some security features in their furniture. So these are the five patterns that I would like to share with you to see how IKEA protect its unique business model with pattern. And for that, you know, I have prepared a IKEA case study handbook. And uh, those of you who are interested, right, to learn more about these five patterns that I'm going to share later, you can download, you can scan and download those a copy of the handbook and you can have uh, information uh, about uh, those five patterns. Uh, 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 you can read about them in more details. Okay, so first, uh, I would like to share with you this very famous pattern by IKEA that make self-assembly uh, self very simple, right? So when a consumer buys the furniture, the flat pad furniture from the IKEA store and you bring it home, you would want to you would want to join them easily, safe and easy, uh, simple self-assembly uh, uh, method or system for you to assemble the part together. So what uh, IKEA has done is they have come up with this uh, uh, wedge door well system uh, where you can have uh, groove on both the male and the female part of the furniture and you can fasten the two furniture parts together without using any tools or without using any fastening means, right? So this is the one of these uh, famous, uh, most famous pattern owned by IKEA, the Wesh the Well uh, pattern, right? It, it makes it faster and easier for customer to assemble furniture and uh, uh, and the, the good thing about this system is you can assemble, you can take them apart and you can reassemble many, many times without losing the structural integrity of your furniture part. And, and this invention came about because of firstly, the customer frustration, right? Uh, every time you buy the IKEA furniture back home, it's very frustrating to put them together. So, and it's also uh, very time consuming, right? So you have to have a solution that can enable you to very quickly put the furnitures together. And you also want to save the cost by doing away with metal fittings and all the tools to put the, uh, the Allen keys to put the furnitures together. So this uh, wedge Dowell uh, solution actually reduced uh, the uh, assembly time by 50 to 80%. Yeah, what you need to do is you just insert the male part of the furniture part into the female part of the furniture and you just swap it in and the whole thing will stay in place and you minimize time, minimize resources. You don't need to have metal fittings and the tools. And by protecting this joint, this special joint, uh, what IKEA has done is you can preempt all the competitors. They can come up with any furniture but you do, cannot use this method to join furniture together. So it is a very a, 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 a pattern of very wide application. So what is this pattern is about, right? So I, I would like to share with you the claim of this pattern. As many of you would know, especially those of you who have found pattern before, the scope of your protection is based on the way you claim your pattern, right? The claim is basically a series of elements that you join together to deliver an end function. So in order to 
pattern this combination, your combination has to be new and it has to be technically better. So what happened in this uh, furniture is uh, you can, if you read from the claim, it, it consists of first furniture part. Uh, first furniture part has a mere uh, part, one or more mere part, and uh, another uh, second furniture part have the female, one or more female part, right? So these two parts, two, two pieces of furniture sub-assembly having one male and one female, and all this male and female has groove, uh, has a number of groove uh, uh, within it. And this groove of the male part and the groove of the female part will cooperate together to join together. Okay, they, they, they just uh, click onto each other to join together. And how do you insert, right? You need to insert the male part into the female part of the furniture. Uh, what you have is you have an insertion position and end position. The insertion position is wider, end position is, is narrower. So in this claim, it is stated that the female part has a triangular shape. When you see from the plan view, it happens from the insertion part to the end position. So once you insert in on the wider side, you push it to the narrower side and the furniture will stay in place. If you want to dismantle it, you push it to the insertion side and you take it out. So this is the joint that enable, you know, a customer to assemble and disassemble easily without having to use uh, any, any metal fitting. Right, so this combination can only be used by IKEA because it is patented by IKEA, and this combination uh, seems very easy, but uh, was the work of you know intense R and D, uh, and it has delivered a lot of value, uh, and it simplified the self assembly by the customer. So, what are the technical advantages? You know, you don't need fastening tools, you don't need fitting means. You can mentor, you can slide in, and you can slide out easily. Uh, you can have precise positioning, right? Last time when you do a metal fitting, you have to position it and you have to drill the hole. Now, no more. Everything is prefixed. You just put it in, you just uh, turn it, then the whole thing will stay in place. So uh, flat packing self-assembly has been made easy due to this pattern. So this, to me, is one of the most important patterns owned by IKEA. And secondly, backpacking, right? You can see in the picture here that the bed can be delivered to your home in a series of flat pack packaging, right? What, what you need to do is you have to go to a, a IKEA store where you have a very wide range of furniture. You just select the furniture you want. You you can bring this to your, your own vehicle and you can drive home and you can assemble a bed out of those flat packs. So in order to transport those flat packs, you need a protective packaging to protect the flat pack. So what IKEA has done is it has uh, made flat packing is not new or you know, IKEA is not the in original inventor. But what IKEA did was IKEA actually bring flatness to entire new level. It made flat packing the linchpin or the essence of its revolutionary business idea. Everything that you buy from IKEA, you have to buy from flat pack, you bring it home, you assemble it yourself. So this flat packing is done from the drawing board, right? When the IKEA en engineer designed their furniture, everything must be able to pack as densely and as flat as possible, right? You, you want to squeeze as many parts into a flat pack as possible. So this squeezing into a backpack, you need a strong packaging to hold it so that when you move it around, you know, you can protect the, the integrity of the furniture parts. And this flat pack not only enable consumer to bring it home, you can also enable smart distribution. You can distribute it easily, right? You can uh, store it at the warehouse easily, and you can put more furniture into the warehouse. You reduce the cost further. 
And this is also good for the environment, right? Because you, you cut down on the number of uh, trips you have to make in order to move the furniture from your house, from the manufacturer, uh, the factory to your house. Uh, in the past, you need to buy from a retail outlet and then you drive home and another lorry would have to go to the warehouse, bring it to your home. There will be two trips. Now, you know, you just go there, you pick it up, you bring it home, only one trip, no two trips. So uh, it has lower environmental impact. So, so I, I would like to explore with you how this uh, IKEA actually do the packing, right? So this is the claim of the IKEA pattern. Uh, basically, if I break it down into its component, uh, it has a base, right? It has a base. It has the first and second sidewall. If you can follow my cursor, it has a base. It can have first and the second uh, sidewall, and it has a lead. So this is normal for any packaging. So the innovative part is you have a first cushioning part. This is the first cushioning part to protect two ends of the furniture. And it also has a first angle. Uh, when you put the sidewall, it is folded at an angle, as you can see, right? Sorry, uh, you can see it, it, it's folded at an angle to create the first uh, deformation zone. This deformation zone will, will create the protection uh, for, for the side of the furniture. And, uh, and the first cushioning part, first cushioning part comprises of an outer gabble and an inner gabble and you have a crossbar to hold this together. So when you cr create this uh, pack packaging, you can fold it up and it become, you know, uh, a deform, uh, end deformation zone. So anger at the sidewall and a uh, first cushioning part at two ends of the furniture. This is how the packaging uh, can protect uh, the furniture. So, and in another embodiment, uh, you can also insert uh, some filling inside. You know, the 1172 is the filling inside. So when you insert inside, this will, can also protect both ends of the furniture packaging. So flat packing packaging uh, is created uh, using this very simple uh, combination. So uh, if you in the logistic business, uh, you, you would wonder, hey, can my packaging be protected? The answer is yes. If you have a new way uh, of uh, protecting the content and uh, this uh, combination uh, is, is better than the previous combination, uh, it is possible for you to own that. Okay, let's move on to the third pattern. Uh, uh, IKEA also uh, invest a lot, do a lot of R&D, not only in the furniture, do a lot of R&D in coming up with a sustainable logistic system, how you can move the flat pack around, how you can store them in the, in the warehouse, how you can take and distribute those flat pack easily. So in the past, I think if you go to warehouse, you go to transportation, you see a lot of wooden pallet. And wooden pallet, not only they are heavy, they are they took up a lot of space, they are also environmentally not friendly. So IKEA came up with this L-shaped profile, L-shaped ledger, to enable uh, them to move their flat packs around cheaply and more easily, and also to store the goods. Uh, in their in their warehouse, so so this is uh, another innovation, yeah, to to reduce the cost. Uh, instead of using a uh, wooden pallet, they come up with these loading ledgers, the L shaped uh, loading ledgers, made of polypropylene plastic. And because it's a polypropylene plastic, it can be recycled many many times, right? So this polypropylene plastic would have two put or two feet, two protrusion at the bottom to props up, you know, the unit load and you work with a strap to strap the flat pack, uh, the, the packaging together. And uh, as a result, you know, because this uh, L ledger is weight, uh, is much lighter than a wooden pallet and it is smaller than a wooden pallet, uh, it occupy less space meaning you can put more packaging into your transportation and also into your warehouse. And 
you don't also when you after you send you don't have to move the wooden pallet back right so it saves a lot of transportation costs and it become more sustainable so what does this uh, pallet wooden pallet uh, what is the uh, uh, essence of this pallet what is the claim of this pattern right so it, it, it is a pallet that uh, comprises of uh, upper leg yeah it has a uh, upper leg and lower leg right upper leg perpendicular to the lower leg and they are made of uh, uh, plastic recyclable plastic and you have protrusion on the lower leg right this protrusion is to prop up so that you can uh, uh, have a forklift uh, to manipulate those uh, uh, box uh, packaging you have uh, this gap for you to uh, go in for the fork forklift to come in and on the uh, vertical leg you have uh, locking mean and this locking mean consists of a uh, strap you can uh, insert the strap through those holes and you can strap it around the packaging and you can move it around so it become a cheaper and uh, more environmentally friendly solution for you to transport and also to store uh, your packaging so this is another important innovation by IKEA you don't see wooden pallet in IKEA storehouse uh, a, a warehouse uh, you only see this type of uh, loading ledge which is patented okay so this is how it works uh, you you can uh, with a protrusion you can have the fork leaf you can uh, more compactly uh, store and also transport the packaging you can recycle you don't have to bring back those wooden pallet you know all these advantages contribute to the lower cost and environmental uh, friendliness uh, the next pattern that I would like to share with you uh, is on the material itself. Uh, uh, IKEA uses a lot of particle board and uh, this particle board has one unique characteristic. Uh, even though it looks, it, it, it is of even thickness, right? It's of the same thickness, but it has varying density, okay? The denser part, is for fastening the normal part the more porous and lighter part is for cost saving so if you look at IKEA's particle board right even though they look of they are of the same even width but it has varying degree of uh, varying degree of uh, density so particle board uh, uh, is one of the way where IKEA can cut, cut costs further, right? So particle board is made of compressed sawdust, wood chips, wood scrap, and you also have the blue light resin, right, to hold those boards together. But if you want to have a large piece of wood, right, a continuous piece of wood, it will cost you a bomb, very expensive. So in order to create a large piece of uh, board, uh, it is much cheaper to use particle board compared to natural wood. And in order to uh, uh, make it stronger, they laminate the particle board with wood or with plastic to give it more strength and give it a sleeker look. So this is how, uh, this is the, the, the unique characteristic of the IKEA uh, particle board. So if you look at the claim of this particular board again, uh, it, 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 the board comprises of uh, the lower and upper lower and upper surface make of fine fraction, uh, very fine fraction, so it looks smooth. And the intermediate layer uh, make of coarser fraction of particle. And at the part where you have, uh, you need to join the furniture to another part of the furniture, uh, you have the stranded part and those stranded part where you, you need to join with another furniture, you create higher density. So it becomes stronger. Uh, so this is how uh, IKEA come up with a board. Any other board manufacturer wants to come up with board of even thickness, but variable uh, density based on where you want to join the furnitures together will be stopped by this pattern from using this solution. And that, uh, IKEA not only patent the board itself, but the process of creating the board in the same pattern that you see 
so the process involves you distribute first the fine particles, then you distribute the cost fraction of the particles, and at the strand, at the point where you want to join the furniture, you put uh, a more coarser, uh, a more stronger uh, particle board. And then the, the upper layer, you put a fine fraction of the particle and you compress all them together to form the particle board. So this uh, pattern cover both the product and the both the product and the process. So what is our technical advantage? You know, uh, you can save cost, right? Uh, you don't have to have all the parts equally uh, uh, strong. Only the parts that you need to interact, you can uh, uh, make it more uh, stronger or denser compared to the part that you don't have to you don't have to inter uh, interjoin with other part. And and in the manufacturing process also, uh, you use less material and also shorter pressing time when you do the machine so as you can see you know everything has been carefully planned we don't want to waste any resources only when it is necessary then you use those material and 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 this is how the cost can be saved further let me just finish with another uh, pattern by ikea on safety right uh, so this is also an important pattern by ikea because uh, sometimes when you have a dresser uh, fixed by yourself at home and it's not joined to the wall, it may fall down, it may tip over and it will injure the user. So uh, Ikea actually faced a lawsuit in US uh, because uh, uh, there were some accidents involving uh, uh, children in US and 8 million units of the dresser were recalled by Ikea because of this accident. Because when you install it, yourself at home and you don't put in the proper safety uh, then it is a hazard a potential hazard right so so uh, in 2016 Ikea has to pay 50 million as settlement uh, to compensate uh, uh, families who lost children due to furniture keeping over so in order to solve this problem when you store at home and there's a potential hazard they come up with a, a cheap resistant dresser uh, meaning, uh, uh, you, you uh, in order for you for this dresser to work, you have you have to have a mechanism to make sure that they are properly properly locked to the wall, right? If it's not properly locked to the wall, then the dresser, the drawer wouldn't be able you wouldn't be able to withdraw uh, the drawer, and and this is the pattern that IKEA uses, right? This is the pattern that IKEA uses to. Uh, the mechanism that Ikea uses to secure the dresser to the wall. Uh, you know, if you look at the claim, again, it's a combination of function features that you can put together for it to uh, prevent tipping over. And it, it comprises of, you know, a bar, you comprises of uh, an anchoring bracket and a receiving, a receiving, if you can see my pointer, this is a this is the guiding bracket and this is the anchoring bracket. So first thing is the guiding bracket, you must uh, link it to the side wall of the furniture and, and you have this anchoring uh, anchoring bracket that you need to insert in. This is called the first position before you insert and the second position. So if you insert in, then you, you fasten the furniture to the wall, then this protrusion will cause the bar to move up, right? It will cause the bar to move up. And when the bar is moved out, then uh, the drawer, uh, the stopper of the drawer will be cleared. It will be in a clear position for the drawer to be open. If it's not properly inserted, uh, it's not probably uh, uh, attached to the wall, then it will be in a restricted position. If it's in a restricted position, uh, the stopper on the drawer will prevent, you know, the drawer from being open or closed properly. Uh, so by coming up with this mechanism, uh, you can ensure that the user will attach the, wall, the, the furniture properly to the wall, right? So, so this is a mechanism introduced uh, by IKEA to ensure safety uh, when you install the furniture yourself at home 
and uh, it eliminates tipping over risk and it prevents serious injuries. So these are the five uh, patterns that I want to share with you uh, and on how we can uh, innovated, come up with features to deliver the flat packing business model and how they own those features using pattern. Uh, last but not the least, I would like to also share a little bit with you about how IKEA uses IP to save tax. So this is one of the function uh, features, right? When you look at IP or pattern or trademark, uh, people always look at IP as a defensive tool, meaning uh, I found pattern to own what I have developed. Uh, this is one of the most basic function of pattern, right? If you don't own it, someone might pattern it and you will not have the right to use it. Uh, also, you can use IP to stop your competitor if they copy your idea, right? This is the offensive function. But IP can also be a profit center, meaning you can create a special purpose vehicle, SPV, to own the IP and collect royalty, which IKEA is doing. And integrated role, meaning you use IP to save tax is one of the, what the, the reason, right, where people uh, uh, want to, uh, one of the functions that IP can play. Tax planning uh, function of IP, sometimes you can use IP uh, to capitalize, create a capital in your company and all that. Uh, today, I'm going to focus on the profit center and the integrated role by IKEA. So this is the, you, you can use IP as a tax saving uh, role uh, where it is called IP royalty planning. So what you mean by IP royalty planning is you set up a special purpose vehicle in a jurisdiction that is IP friendly, meaning they give favorable treatment for IP income, right? So if you can uh, park your IP in that jurisdiction and you use that vehicle to collect royalty, probably you can save some tax, uh, legally save some tax. So this is what IKEA is doing, right? So uh, in 1980, uh, previously IKEA only have one company. It, 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 it own IP, it do business, it, cre it, it, do, uh, it, it run saw, uh, everything is in one. A lot of businesses also put IP and operation in one, right? But when you grow to a certain, uh, uh, when you grow to a certain level and you reach a certain level of sophistication, you might want to split your IP ownership from your business operation. So this is what IKEA did in 1980. The founder decided to implement a franchise model similar to McDonald, splitting the retail store from the IP, right? It created two companies. This one is called the IKEA Group, uh, which is uh, run by IKEA Holding, and it does the retail side of the business the fulfillment side of the business, service side of the business. And you have another IP holding company called the IKEA Inter IKEA system that owns all the brands and the IP and franchise out this business, not only to IKEA group, its own company, but also to franchisee. It has many, many franchisees. Like, you know, in Asia, you have Ikano. Ikano in Malaysia, in Singapore, Malaysia is Ikano. Uh, if you go to countries like Hong Kong, Indonesia, you have Dairy Farm, which is their, their franchisee. So, so IKEA created a special purpose vehicle to own the IP, and this special purpose vehicle is parked in a, a IP-friendly jurisdiction and collect royalties worldwide. And, and this is the structure by IKEA. Uh, IKEA uh, inter IKEA system, the owner of IP is based in Holland. Holland has certain uh, tax advantages like relating to withholding tax and all that. When you pay money in and out of Holland, you don't have to pay withholding tax. That's the advantages. And also have some favorable uh, tax advantage for, for IP owner. And eventually, the eventual owner of IKEA brand is in a foundation, a company, a foundation called the Interrego Foundation, which is incorporated in Lintestin. Lintestin is a, 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 a very small country based in Europe, right? And Lintestin has this uh, advantage that whenever you collect a uh, dividend, right? If 
all the profit made by the IP, if you are IP owner, you pay the profit back to uh, the foundation in Lynchenston. You don't have to pay tax on dividend. Okay, so this is how they structure IKEA structure their their system. So all the sales by all the franchises worldwide, three percent of the sales revenue is paid as royalty to Inter IKEA IP holding company. The profit here pay back to Interego Foundation. Manufacturing done in all the low cost country in the world and to have the maximum cost saving. So, so this is the ultimate, right? This is an uh, ultimate uh, uh, structure of uh, IKEA, corporate structure. Uh, IKEA Group do the store business and IP holding company pop in uh, Netherlands, Holland, collect loyalty. And, and they also, IKEA, uh, IKEA also, you know, do it in such a way that, uh, you know, IKEA brand was transferred from the foundation originally, uh, was part, uh, well, it was bought in, right? It originally was outside, but it was bought in for 9 billion euro into Inter IKEA. And in the foundation, lend the money, part of the money to Inter IKEA. And in, or, in order, and, and because of this loan from Inter IKEA, you have to pay interest. So this interest that you pay for the loan is tax deductible in Holland. So all the royalty that you collect, the 3% royalty, you have, you can offset it with the interest that you, you can, you know, the saving, the interest, the tax deduction uh, from the interest payment. So in effect, you don't have to pay tax because you offset the royalty with the interest and, and, and the profit that you make, you pay back, uh, IKEA pay back to the foundation. Uh, so this is what IKEA is doing, and it's quite controversial, but uh, it is uh, the system that is uh, adopted. So with that, I think I come to the end of my presentation. Uh, uh, we, we would like to keep on exploring business model, business strategy with IP strategy. And this is the, uh, what we have in, in store next for you, an IP case study. Uh, we want to explore like IKEA, the, case, the business model of iPad, uh, Apple, and how Apple, you know, develop uh, uh, technologies and IP to support its business model. And we'll do that seminar on the 12th of January next year, 2023. And if you like what you hear, uh, you can join us again uh, for the, our next installment of the webinar. So with that, I come to the end of my webinar. I I will pass the floor back to uh, Jai. Right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lok, for the interesting presentation uh, that helps us to understand more about the crucial IP aspects to IKEA success. So we will now take some time to answer your questions. All right. Uh, yeah, there's a question from Mr. Chua. Uh, he asked whether he can imitate IKEA's furniture but change the design and file design pattern for it. You can change the design and bypass the design, but you have to be careful about the pattern, right? Some of the IKEA furniture might have pattern protection, and pattern protection covers not the shape but the function and the combination. Let's say, for example, the wedge to well joint that we talked about just now, right? You can change the shape of the furniture, but if you copy the joint, which is already patented by IKEA, uh, then there will be an issue. Uh. Or, you know, if you want to copy the particle board, right? You thought, hey, IKEA, do that, we can also do. I can create a particle board with variable density, uh, same uh, flat, you know, same, width but variable density uh, that function also that combination also was patented by ikea so if you copy that but you change the shape still there will be infringement uh. so you have to be careful uh, what what has been protected and you must not copy the ip uh, that has been uh, covered by by the company 
All right, uh, there's another question from Mr. Ting Jing Yuan. Uh, he asks about the uh, what is the process of IP application in Malaysia, uh, what documents he need, uh, how long it takes, and so forth. Pattern or design? Uh, he said IP application. I think it includes uh, pattern, trademark, and also design. Oh, okay. Uh, a pattern, yeah, he said pattern. Pattern, okay. In order to file a pattern, uh, what you need is to search whether oh, you, you, you have a new uh, solution, right? A new combination. Uh, and you need to see whether this new combination is it unique, right? So the first thing you need to do, or we can help you to do, is to do a pattern search to see whether this combination has it been patented by anyone else. If not, then uh, we can proceed next to draft the pattern and we can file the pattern. So the drafting uh, of the specification and the filing, uh, we as the patent attorney can assist you for that. And uh, uh, after filing, the pattern will go through examination. Uh, and once you file your pattern, your combination is protected. So this is, in a nutshell, what it takes for you to file an IP pattern in Malaysia or anywhere else in the world. We follow the same process anywhere else in the world. Yep, like for example, if you were to file in Singapore, it could take about uh, maybe two plus years uh, to get it granted if, if it goes smoothly. Uh, but in Malaysia, it would take a longer time and also in other Southeast Asia countries too. Yeah, Singapore has come up with a, uh, you know, uh, uh, IP fast program and uh, you can get your patent granted less than a year. That's the world fastest. Uh, the rest of the country, I think usually it takes uh, three to four years. Uh, there are ways to expedite the pattern depending on the countries. Uh, but the thing is, once you file, you are protected, right? Because once the pattern is approved, it starts from the filing date for 20 years. So you can start using pattern pending uh, once you file the pattern. All right. So uh, we don't have any further questions. Uh, so... Yeah, before we conclude today's uh, session, feel free to download our handbook uh, of today's topic uh, on IKEA by scanning the QR code here. And if you have any further questions, uh, you can always contact us and post, uh, you know, send your questions to us. So again, uh, we will have our final topic of this IP and case study series next year on the 12th of January uh, at 2 p.m. Singapore time. So the last topic is about Apple. So if you are a fan of Apple products or you are very interested to learn about Apple's IP strategy, please scan this QR code to register. Or you may also contact us uh, through this um, email and also uh, phone number. All right, we do provide a 30 minute free consultation session. So if you have any questions related to uh, IP, intellectual property application, or even monetization, or any other methods, uh, you can always contact us uh, at this email and address and also this phone number. All right, so uh, thank you, Mr. Lok, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. All right, thank you.